beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. And good morning to you all and welcome to worship. Good morning to you, those of you who are online as well. We're grateful you could be with us today. Um, we have not one but two sacraments we're going to be celebrating today. The sacrament of Holy Communion, as you can see, and also the sacrament of baptism with the Christic family a little bit later on in the service today. I want to share with you a few announcements before we begin the service today. And uh, that is a couple of well, some meetings, really, that are coming up. Uh, administration Committee meets tomorrow night, 8 o'clock p.m. here at the church. Vision Team. Um, is meeting this Tuesday in my office as we prepare, and this is kind of an update for you as well, as we prepare for the presentation to the session of the church life and ministry vision that the vision team has been working on for quite some time now. So that's coming up this, this Tuesday. Thursday, the worship committee is meeting is, uh, at 6.30 p.m. And uh, for those of you who want to come back today, a big special day for, for Pete Carlisle. Um, his 98th birthday celebration taking place in the pavilion following the second service, and you'll see all the details in there about that as well. Um, please note the flowers at the front of the church today are in honor, and this is kind of a great, new, great news too, and I know they like to watch online, so happy 45th wedding anniversary, Chuck and Diane Bell. That's fantastic. So, so excited about that. Please note too, the Women's Association uh, ladies love and laughter breakfast hoedown style we like that september the 24th at uh, 9 30 a.m and i know that dawn has an announcement for the good of the body this morning dawn here we go let's make sure this one's working it is there you go sure sure good morning and happy august how's your summer been it has flown by for me and here we are standing looking into our fall ministries here at new bedford church for children's ministry mm. so i encourage you to stop by the red table stop by the watermelon tables first to get your coffee and your treats and then come see me at the red table there's some papers out there with a fun fact on it that pertains to all of you and also with what openings and what needs we have for children's ministry coming into the fall programming year so i encourage you to stop by to see about Sunday School, Jam Kids, and for Awana. And lastly, I want to, like everyone to pull out your message notes, put the time 2.15 on your paper. And I'm asking everyone to be intentionally praying for our programming here at New Bedford at 2.15. And why 2.15 is because Awana stands for Approved Workmen Are Not Ashamed. And that's on the Bible verse, 2 Timothy 2.15. Ah. So there's my 215. So every year in August, I set an alarm on my phone at 215. You can pick AM or PM. I pick PM to intentionally pray for our programs, for the children and family of our community, for the leaders that God is urging to step into these ministries and to share his love and kingdom work with the children and family of our communities. So please intentionally be in prayer for New Bedford Church as we look into this fall, to look into the programs and the ministries, and I look forward to seeing you at the Red Table after church today. Thank you very much, Dawn, and for those of you who decide on 2.15 a.m., you'll have special grace. So, <laughs> And um, I just announced their anniversary thinking they were watching online today, but they actually walked into the church, so shall we all give a happy 45th wedding anniversary to Chuck and Diane Bell today. <laughs> happy anniversary, guys. I thought you were online and I already announced it, so, so there you go, happy anniversary to you. Any other announcements for the good of the body this morning? Seeing none, let us stand now for our call to worship, which is contained um, in your bulletin on the screen. This is adapted from Psalm 90, and let's say this together this morning. 
Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us, that we might serve you and point others to you. Praise to you, Lord. Let us worship God. like you, Lord, and, and make us to do your work and to be the hands and feet of you, Lord, and we ask that you give us a pure heart as we do that so that when we do your work, Lord, people can see you in us, Lord, so that we can be like Jesus and spread your good news. I could walk through when you don't give me answers 
as I cry out to you. I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Truth is you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So in all things be my life and breath. I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. You are my strength and comfort. You are my steady hand. You are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher. Your plans are always good. There's not a place where I'll go. You've not already stood. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. 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 As you are this morning, let us come to our Lord now, our firm foundation in a time of prayer. 
Let us pray. Lord God, it is so good to, to worship you, to sing praises to your name as we did through those three wonderful songs this morning. Lord, we praise you for your glory displayed in the heavens. We praise you for your might, more powerful than the fiercest storm. And we had a pretty fierce storm yesterday, but Lord, you're more powerful than that. Praise to you, Lord, for your presence, the gentle whisper in our ears to let us know that you are near to us and will never let us go. Lord, we give you thanks this morning for many things. Thanks, Lord, for the successful healing from surgery for Diane Bell, back with us this morning. Thanking you, Lord, for 98 years of life for Pete Carlisle, celebrating his birthday today. Praising you, Lord, for young life, like that of Lord of Calvin Krissick. Lord, life truly going on, your plan truly playing out as we get a chance to see it this weekend. And Lord, as we reflect back on this past week or two weeks in our lives, we know there are special things that, that you're placing on each of our individual hearts to, to give you thanks for this morning. And so, Lord, now in the quiet of our hearts, we, we express our thanksgivings to you. Lord, as we thank you, we also must confess. Romans chapter 3 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Lord, we know that's true. We know, Lord, that as we talk about the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, we know, Lord, that in this past week, that at least in one of those areas, each of us has stumbled. And so, Lord, because we have direct access to you through Jesus, because we don't have to go through a mediator like a priest, Lord, we come to you directly now with our private and our personal confessions. Thank you, Lord, that you not only heard those confessions, but thank you, Lord, that we can know that over 2,000 years ago, you took care of our sins on the cross. You atoned for them. You wiped them out. Sins past, present, and future, so that we might come into your throne room, that we might have access to you. We thank you for that, Lord, even as we pray, Lord, intercessory prayers now. Pray for David Boyd, Lord, with his bowel obstruction for healing. We pray for Elizabeth DeHaven, Lord, and Madison, both diagnosed with COVID. And for Elizabeth's son, Tim, Lord, who's in critical care in the hospital. We pray, Lord, for Melissa in Erie, a friend of Elaine Hepler, Lord, who've, who had extensive repair and the removal of scar tissue of, in, in her bowel and liver, and now has fluid filled up in her lungs. We pray for all of those, Lord, diagnosed with cancer or battling cancer, for their healing, Lord, and for their peace. We pray for all those who are battling mental illness in our families, Lord. We're needing to be chemically balanced, Lord, that you would give them the clarity to take their medication, Lord, and we would be so bold as to pray that you would heal them of that chem chemical imbalance. We pray for all of those, Lord, battling relationship struggles, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would intervene in conflicts between husband and wife or parent and child or child and parent or extended family. We pray, Lord, for wisdom for our president and for the Congress and for our federal, state, and local leaders. And we ask now, Lord, that you would hear our private and personal prayers lifted up to you today.
Thank you, Lord, for hearing all of those prayers. And thank you, Lord, that you gave us a model to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As I said, we have not one but two sacraments this morning. Now we come to the sacrament of baptism. It's the sacrament of baptism this morning in the life of Calvin Michael Krusik. And we want to welcome some family members who are here today. Um, Ed and Janet Krusik here today. Um, Fred and Marie Gentile. Also Michelle Grazia here today. And uh, Mike and Carla's niece Olivia. Are you there as well? Uh, somewhere back there? Yep. Okay. Glad you're here today. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And we want to talk to this morning again about the meaning of baptism. Um, as I was sharing with the, with the family and talking with them this week on the phone, that uh, it is different here um, in Reformed theology than it is, say, in Catholic theology or other places. Uh, we proclaim here that, uh, that Calvin is not going to be saved when I baptize him this morning. He's not going to become instantly a Christian when I baptize him. What we're doing is we're setting him apart for Christian instruction with the prayer that one day he will come to saving faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He'll make a credible profession himself of faith in Jesus. Now, we baptize with water because baptism, because water has always been a symbol of salvation. You think of uh, the Israelites passing through the Red Sea or, or the Israelites entering the Promised Land uh, across the Jordan River at flood stage. And most famously, you think of Jesus uh, being baptized by John the Baptist in the, in the Jordan River to begin his ministry. We, uh, we baptize infants as well because we in Reformed theology proclaim God's ability to get hold of our hearts before we have the intellectual capacity to make a profession of faith in him. And so with that said this morning, I would like to call up at this time uh, Mike and Carla and Calvin and also supporting them um, in this baptism this morning, uh, friends and, uh, and loved ones in the family, uh, Dave Glazier and Glazier and uh, Laura Arnold as well. If you'll all come forward, that would be wonderful. And Calvin is all set, and he's being really good this morning. There we are. Okay. <laughs> you can come up too. The whole family's invited. There you go. Okay. To Mike and to Carla. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and baptize and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always, he said, to the very end of the age. And so Mike and Carla, in presenting Calvin for baptism, you're declaring before this congregation and before God your desire that he be set apart for Christian instruction and to raise him in the ways of the Christian faith. And so we're going to ask you to acknowledge that by answering these questions this morning. Do you acknowledge Calvin's need for the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you claim God's covenant promises and benefits for Calvin? And by faith, do you look to the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation as you do your own? Do you? Do you now unreservedly dedicate Calvin to God, and do you promise by relying on, the, on God's power and grace through the Holy Spirit to live an exemplary life before him? Do you? Do you commit yourself to pray with and for Calvin, to teach him the scriptures and the great articles of our faith in Jesus Christ? Do you? Do you promise to use... Sorry, I'm just looking at him like looking at his brother. There. That's kind of cool. <laughs> do you promise to use every means provided by God including faithful participation in the life of this church to bring Calvin up in the loving discipline of the Lord. Do you? Wonderful. I'm going to call upon Elder Steve Fox to come forward now and to ask questions to the congregation. And uh, we're going to ask the congregation at this point to stand, please. There you go, Steve. Do you, the members of New Bedford Presbyterian Church, representing the whole body of Christ, the Christian Church Universal, 
assume responsibility with Mike and Carla for the spiritual nature of Calvin? Do you commit as much as you are possible to set a godly example before him and to provide as far as you are able all that is necessary to the end that Calvin may one day confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? You may be seated. And uh, Steve, share with me. Here we go. I'll take that back from you. Steve, share with me something wonderful this morning. It, it's, uh, I'm going to start doing this in ministry now, that the, the session is presenting to you this morning, uh, Calvin uh, Michael Christick for baptism. And with that in mind, let's, uh, let's do it. <laughs> there we go. There we are. There we go, buddy. He, yeah, he's going to cry eventually? Hope not. But this is warm water, so maybe he won't. <laughs> I was saying the elders of my last church used to put cold water in here just to make that happen. It's not nice. Calvin, Michael, Christick, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May the Spirit of God descend upon you now, and may he rest in you now, and forevermore. Amen. I'll get that thing off your eye before it goes in there. There we go. Let's take a walk, shall we? Meet Calvin, Michael, Christick. You have committed to raise him in the Christian faith. He wants to, he wants to high-five you, Gary. <laughs> You've committed to raise him in the Christian faith. He's, uh, he's already a bright boy, as you can see. Very inquisitive, too. It's, uh, and, uh, and he doesn't have the hairline of, uh, of, of dad and me, either. So, <laughs> There we go. Say hi to him. He's kind of saying hi to him. How are you doing, buddy? He's, he's looking at me now. <laughs> There we go. There we are. I'll walk him down here, too. This is Sam, by the way. You'll like him. He's a good guy. There we are. A bit more here. There he is. Isn't he, isn't he lovely, as the, as the old Stevie Wonder song says, huh? Isn't that great? There he is. There he is. Yeah, I'll walk him past here. To, we've got to get him to the back row, too, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> to the back row as well. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, I do like my job. <laughs> That's pretty good. Shall we have a big hand for the Christic family this morning? There we go. There we are. There we go, buddy. And he didn't cry once. Look at him. So, brother, so big brother was wrong. He didn't cry. <laughs> when it's close to his time to nap, he cries? Okay, well, that's, that's so do I. So that's okay. <laughs> we have a special treat for you this morning. So you set apart Calvin for Christian instruction, um, raising him in the ways of faith. And so now two others or other family members that you have coveted it with in the Folkman family are now going to share this morning with some special music. We invite the Folkman family to come forward now and to share with us.
And they're going on tour next week, as a matter of fact, I think. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I love their singing, and I also love the moms doing the gestures down here. That was as much fun to watch as well. That was pretty good. Well, this morning we're going to begin a, a brand new sermon series that's going to take us right through to Labor Day. And uh, the name of this sermon series is called Missing Pieces. Is there, is there something I need beside Jesus? And the reason why I think it's very relevant to today is there's many different competing forces you know, for our attention to, to give us physical satisfaction in life and, and spiritual satisfaction in life. There's, there's money, there's sex, there's power, there's, there's success in your job, there's success in your business, there's all these other types of things. And also people look for satisfaction in possessions. As a matter of fact, as I was researching for this sermon, I came across something that uh, Dawn and I were talking about before the service started, that she, she knows Madam Blueberry. We're going to ask you to put that up on the screen here now, Nate, if you can, with the sound down. Madam Blueberry is from the Veggie Tales uh, Christian cartoon series, and, and uh, this particular story about Madam Blueberry is because she's so sad. She's singing, in fact, the I'm Blue song, for those of you who might know this, and the reason why she's so sad is because she's jealous of the possessions that other people have. So jealous, in fact, that she has a display there of all the possessions that other people have that she wishes that she could have, and she keeps going over it and going over it and going over it and getting more and more sad as a result of it. Uh, her supposed salvation um, is when something opens up across the street uh, from her treehouse. Yes, she lives in a treehouse. Um, and it's, uh, I love the name of the store they came up with. It's called Stuff Mart was the name of it. And so that's supposedly going to give Madam Blueberry some satisfaction. Uh, we are starting this new sermon series. We're going to be focusing in on Paul's letter to the Colossians. Um, Paul wrote this letter as one of his prison letters, written around 60 to 62 AD. Um, Paul writes this particular letter to the city of Colossae. Now, Colossae is uh, located, uh, the region is called Phrygia back in the first century. We would now know the area as modern-day Turkey. And, uh, and Paul did not convert these people. God did not use Paul to bring these people to saving faith in, in Jesus. It was actually somebody that, by the name of Epaphras who, who, was, who God used to lead all the Colossians to faith. Epaphras had gone to hear Paul preach and teach in Ephesus at one time, he got converted and took the, the message back to, to the Colossians, and they became Christians. And, and as I say, now Paul is, is, um, is writing these from prison, or at least from house arrest in Rome, as recorded for us in the last couple of chapters of the book of Acts. And Epaphras has come to visit him because there's some strange things that are kind of being infiltrated into the, the Christian church in Colossae. Some, some very strange things, as I was researching this, is kind of a mixture of, of pagan ideas and Judaism all kind of mushed together in this predominantly Gentile area, actually. Uh, things like this, that, that Jesus was not got God come down to earth, that he was kind of a, a created being who emanated, is what the term is, emanated along with the angels, um, from God, and that God dispersed certain powers to these angelic cosmic beings. Um, it's mixed in with pagan ideas because it's thought that these kind of angelic astral beings um, were in charge of earth and wind and fire, and that, so you had to worship them. You had to worship these angels, of which Jesus was, was just one, and then you did this, and here's where the Judaism comes in, you did this by doing uh, Jewish ceremonies, their dietary practices, uh, keeping all of their festivals, radical denial of the faith, something like that, things like that. And so Paul sends this letter back with Epaphras to kind of correct these things. And over these next few weeks, we're going to look at how he does that, how we see how Jesus is, is um, all that we need, is what we're going to focus in on this morning. Jesus is all that we need. Uh, we don't need any other missing pieces. There are no other missing pieces. And so this morning, I'm going to invite you to turn to the first chapter of Colossians. This is Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 23. As Paul sets the stage, he doesn't actually call out the heresy that's going on in the first century, a heresy that kind of 
uh, parallels with our looking to other things besides Jesus for satisfaction in our life as well. He doesn't spell it out, but you see hints of it throughout this, this first part of the letter. So for those of you who like to follow along your own Bibles, now's the time to open them or your devices, or you can follow along with the message notes or on the screen. Paul writes this, inspired by God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. To the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven, and that you've already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you, of course, through Epaphras, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit, along with other things that were going on in Colossae as well. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, and probably heard about the things going on, We've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And now he starts to address this idea, is Jesus truly God? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile him to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body, not an angelic being, but a physical body, through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. May God bless the reading of this, his holy word, his first look at the letter to Colossians this morning. And would you pray with me, please? And so, Lord, I pray today that, Lord, you would help us to see in many ways how you, Jesus, are all that we need. In your name I pray, amen. And so as I said, we're going to look more and more at, uh, at how you don't need anything else but Jesus. But today I want to focus in really looking at these first 23 verses and kind of going back and forth at different verses this morning, looking at five different beliefs you need to have to, to know that Jesus is all that you need beyond material possessions, Beyond success, he is all that you need. The first belief is this, to believe who Jesus truly is. He is not a created being, as some of the false teachers in Colossae thought. He's not just a good man, as you've heard so many people say, those who believe he did exist in history. Well, he was just a good man. Paul says this, inspired by God in verse 15, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Image of God. It doesn't mean that like a painting. I was looking at a painting the other day. You know how paintings, uh, I was looking actually in my office, there's a painting of John Coltrane, uh, a charcoal sketch of John Coltrane on my wall in my office at home. And uh, 
yeah, it's a likeness of John Coltrane, but it's not perfect. You know, it's not like, not like a snapshot that captures him perfectly. Jesus captures God perfectly. As it says here in, in verse 19, he is pleased to have all his fullness. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, dwell in Jesus. We're going to talk more next week about what that means by all his fullness, but for now, know this, that all the characteristics, that all the qualities, that all the powers of God rest in Jesus. And that he, as it says here, was not a created being. Verse 17a, he was before all things. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, before all things, before the universe was created, he, he, he was there. It says in verse 16a, for by him all things were created. He created everything, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. I love how one theologian I studied, William Hendrickson, describes this. He said, think of the most distant star, you know, that's out there. The most distant star there is. And think about the fact that Jesus created that distant star and organized it in such a way that it would have an impact uh, in the plan that he has for your life and for my life. Pretty astounding. It says in verse 17, be that in him all things hold together. John MacArthur, another great theologian, described the fact that Jesus provides balance and continuity in the whole of the created order. I think that's, that's just amazing. And so what does that mean to you and me practically? It means as we go through stuff in life right now, as we experience things that are happening in the world around us, as we experience... Um, economic uncertainty and inflation and, uh, and divisions in government, as we've seen for these last couple of years, and, and, and threats of illness through, through COVID or, or now monkeypox and other things. Um, the war in Ukraine, wars and rumors of wars, as Jesus talked about it. Um, tension now building with China. It means that in all of these things, Jesus himself is still sovereign. He's still in control that you need not worry. It's like this tapestry that's being created. Looked at a, ever looked at a tapestry? You know, I don't know many of you have made tapestries in, in your lives. How beautiful it is on the outside, how, how intricate and how beautiful the patterns are. Then you turn it around, right? You turn it around and you see all the threads and the knots and the imperfections. That's what the world seems like to us sometimes. It seems like chaos to us. But he's in control. Every single authority, every single power. As it says in, in verse 13, or chapter 13 of Romans, there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been, have been established by God. When you think of Vladimir Putin, when you think of President Xi of China, when you think of, of the NATO leaders like President Macron of France or the, or the current prime minister, I don't remember who he is now, that Johnson stepped down of, of Great Britain, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau in Canada, of course, our own president. They are all in power because God has allowed it to happen, because Jesus has allowed it to happen. Jesus is who he truly says he is. There's nobody you need to look to but him. But here's the other astounding news contained in this letter, why Jesus and how Jesus is all you need. The second belief is this, to believe that Jesus has rescued you. He's rescued you. I was thinking of rescue operations that have taken place, and I'm really going to date myself here um, by thinking about the Iranian hostage crisis. Those who are my age or maybe a little bit younger, and certainly those older, remember the Iranian hostage crisis of, of 1979, in which the Ayatollah Khomeini came to power in Iran, and, and, and uh, people stormed the, the U.S. embassy in Tehran, took 52 hostages. They were hostages for month after month after month. Remember that? But you also remember that, uh, that there were also six individuals who were smuggled out before, before the embassy went down. Six American embassy workers smuggled out. It was the work of, uh, of Ambassador Ken Taylor uh, of, of Canada and uh, working with the CIA. Uh, if you've, those of you who have seen the movie Argo have seen this, this depicted, seen it uh, dramatized and presented for you as, as working with the CIA, CIA Ken Taylor um, got forged documents and made these six American diplomats look like Canadian film producers who are out scouting a location. Yeah, I want to scout a location and film in Tehran sometime. But, uh, but that's what they convinced the Iranian authorities of, and they were able to, to escape. They were rescued, rescued in secret. Jesus was very out front in his rescue for us. He 
taught in those synagogues when he walked the earth. He went through a public trial. He went through a public execution. He went through a public resurrection in which he was seen after the resurrection, the Bible records, by over 500 people. He rescued us, as it says here in verse 13 and 14, he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The, the kingdom of darkness is a fancy way of saying Satan's, quote, kingdom. How he works with his minions to, to promote discord in us and sin and hatred and envy and, and, and all those other things, malice and, and all the other things that take place in our lives. He's saying that he has defeated that. He's saying that in verse, in verse 21, that once you were alienated from God, another way of translating that word alienated is you were estranged. Remember uh, when you had a disagreement with a brother or sister and you didn't talk to them for a while? You know, it said that you were estranged from your brother or sister for, for a period of time. Well, we were estranged from God until, as it says here, uh, enemies in our minds because of our evil behavior, but now we are reconciled, it says in verse 22, by Christ's physical body through death be present, to be presented in his sight, holy without blemish, free from accusation. I love this imagery. You know, back in the first century, if you, were, if you were in debt to somebody, sometimes you had to go into slavery to pay down that debt. And uh, somebody might come along and pay off your debt, redeem you so that you are freed from slavery. Well, it says for us here in, in verse 14 that we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus because he has paid the price for us. He has, he has paid off our debt on the cross. And so, so far we've established that, that Jesus is all that we need because of who he is and because what he's did in our lives. We, we can't work our way to God by, by doing the, just the right things in life, by, by praying just the right way or by, or by trying to do lots of good works. We can't, uh, in the first century, they couldn't do this either by, by worshiping angels or, or by doing all those Jewish ceremonies that took place in, in this Gentile land. They couldn't work their way to God. But there's a third belief which is really powerful for you and me today as we, as we live this life. And it's this, that we need to believe that Jesus is growing you. Growing you. It says in, in, verse, in, in chapter, chapter 1, verse 9c, that he grows you in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. He gives you spiritual insights so that you don't uh, think that your, your only means of coping in life is just to escape. You know, I want to escape to Key West, Florida and live my life like a Jimmy Buffett song. No, it's, it's, it's not that. You need to realize he's going to grow you. How does he grow you? A number of different ways he grows you. For example, in your notes, he says he grows you, to be, he grows you by showing you his will for how you should live. It says here in, in verse 9b, he fills you with the knowledge of his will. How does he do that? One of the reasons why I encourage you to read the Bible because when you read the Bible, you get an idea of how God says you should live life. And live, that living life will give you peace no matter what circumstance is going on in your life right now. But then he also does it this way. He builds your patience and your endurance. Here's what he says in verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you might have great endurance and patience. I love how one Bible scholar described, described this. He said, patience is dealing with the trials in your life. Endurance is dealing with the people who cause trials in your life. I like that. It's kind of kind of neat. Um, Lori Smith, in one of our Sunday school classes a couple weeks ago, we were talking about this idea of patience. And, uh, and the idea that she shared was when a trial happens in her life, and I love this, she said when a trial happens in her life, that, uh, that the first thing she thinks of is, what are you trying to teach me, Jesus? I think that's Christian maturity. What are you trying to teach me, Jesus? And there may be a number of things that, that Jesus wants to teach us in this life. He may want to teach us, for example, of, um, he may want to teach you that, uh, that, um, that when a trial comes your way, you don't rush to try and fix it. You, uh, you don't rush around in life. You take your time in life. He may allow a trial to, to, to come your way for numerous other reasons as well. He, he may be bringing that trial into your life to, to be able to snap you out of disobedience that may be happening in your life, to snap you out of it. Uh, 
to, to bring you back into the fold, so to speak, he may be allowing that trial to, to come into your life to, to help you with the idea of, of knowing that it's his strength and his strength alone that will get you through. You know, you've had those situations in your life when it seems like it's one thing after another. You know, this has gone wrong, and, and this has gone wrong, and this has gone wrong, and this has gone wrong, and it's a, it seems like it's a whole thing crashing down upon you. Remember those times when that's happened for you. And remember how you just kept going. That's God giving you the strength to keep you going. Sometimes he allows trial after trial to happen just to remind you where your strength comes from. My strength, God said through Paul, is made perfect in, in weakness. But he doesn't just help you endure. He doesn't just grow you in faith. He also promises you something too. A promise that can't be made by angels, a promise that can't be made by, by purchasing the next great vehicle or, or, or anything else. A promise of this. Belief number four. Believe in the harmony that he'll bring. In the harmony that he'll bring to your life. He says this in verse 20. That he is there to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. When Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't just you and I who fell into sin, that we got knocked out of whack, but the whole universe got knocked out of whack. And so what the promise of Jesus is, through his shed blood, this is a hint for us of when he returns again, that he's going to make everything right, that when the new heavens and the new earth happen, that there's going to be harmony not just in our own souls, but also in the world as well. As hinted for us in the, in the book of Isaiah, in which it says, the wolf will lie down with the the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. As Christians, you get hints of this alignment, like how the wheels of a car are aligned to, to keep you motoring through life. We get hints of this all the time. The peace that he gives you, the peace that he may have given you this past week, in the midst of circumstances that were really trying for you, or the perspective that he's given you in these past couple of weeks with a disappointment that took place in your life that you didn't expect that has really wounded you and really hurt you. But he also gives us hints of this alignment through, through the way he's grown Christianity throughout the history of the world. I know in the last sermon series we talked a lot about how Christianity is, is on the wane here in, here in America that uh, less and less people are professing to be Christians, but, but that's not the history of Christianity in the world, and it's certainly not the history, uh, certainly not the present of what's going on with the spread of Christianity throughout the world outside of the United States. I mean, think of this for a second. Christianity started with 12 apostles, and then it grew as the apostles went out along with Jesus and ministered to people and shared faith with them. At Pentecost, 3,000 people came to faith the same day, and Christianity continued to grow. I was researching this and found this incredible to, to, to know that 50 years after the last apostles died, half a million Christians existed in the Roman Empire. By 323 AD, Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire. Then there was the revivals that took place throughout history, three revivals in this country, the First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, the Azusa Street Revival at the beginning of the, the 20th century. You see... Christianity spreading in Muslim countries. Our Presbytery works with Sierra Leone, a predominantly Muslim country, more and more people coming to faith. And then talking about those tensions with China, this one blew me away. Do you know that right now, as China continues to suppress Christianity throughout its population, that there are now, by estimate, over 100 million Christians in China? more Christians in China than there are members of the Communist Party. Isn't that fascinating? Christianity will not be stopped. Jesus is truly all that you need. And that leads us to the final belief today, which is to believe that there is, quite simply, no one else. No one comes close. Jesus is sovereign Lord, sovereign Lord of your life. He's telling the Colossians there's no sense worshiping any creature that he has created any angelic being. He's telling them you don't worship Caesar, you don't worship angels, you don't worship anything else. He's telling us that you don't put your trust in, 
in Warren Buffett or Jeff Bezos or any captain of industry. You don't put your trust in any, any president or, or politician or, or political party because they're all, as we talked about the other week, they're all flawed human beings. We're all sinners saved by grace. Instead, as my late first wife Susan wrote in one of her songs, uh, this week would have been her 65th birthday actually, she wrote, look to the light of Jesus and find peace for your souls. Jesus is the missing piece that we all need. Jesus fills the God-shaped hole in all of our hearts. Jesus is truly all that we need, which is why he's invited us to come to this table. Not a Presbyterian table, not a Baptist table, not a Roman Catholic table, a Methodist table, or a Pentecostal table. The table of our Lord Jesus Christ. All who are believers in Jesus are invited to this table. And if you are not a believer in Jesus, I want to share with you something very, very briefly. You put that up for me right now, those three circles. Believing in him comes from the idea of realizing that you're broken. And that you try many different things to try and fix that brokenness in your life. The biggest basic problem that you have is that you're separated from God due to something called sin. You're not how God originally designed you to be. He designed you to be, to be like him. But sin caused that separation. But Jesus did something about it. That circle down at the bottom. He, he came down to earth. That's the arrow going down. And shared good news, which is the gospel. That he and he alone is the way to faith. That he went to the cross for your sins. That he rose from the dead. That's the arrow going up. And if you want to become part of his family of faith, you just need to want to change your ways. That's what repent means. And believe that Jesus is who he says he is. That he did what he said he did. He's the only way to heaven. And that's going to enable you to recover and pursue God's design. Not perfectly until we meet Jesus face to face. But with that Holy Spirit working in you that I've talked about, he can, he can help you to pursue, recover, and move towards God's design towards your life. And so, if you've not become a Christian, my prayer for you today is that you will. If you are not a Christian and you're still searching, I invite you not to partake. You can take that slide down now, Nate. Thank you. Um, not to partake here today, but just to watch the other Christians partaking because God may use that in a powerful way to be able to, to convict you of, of what you're missing and bring you to faith. Now, we proclaim here today that this is not just a memorial of what Jesus did for us. We know that and uh, we believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is present whenever we celebrate this sacrament. The way we're going to celebrate it this morning is as we've been doing since COVID happened. We're going to do it by what's called intinction. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to call a few elders up. Uh, they're going to be here with bread and juice, and we're going to dismiss you outside rows first, center rows uh, next, and uh, have you take the bread and the juice, deposit them in the trash cans that are beside me here, and then uh, exit up the center aisle and return. We're going to have the worship team do this first um, so that they can be leading us in music as we go. And when you come back to your seat, we're going to ask that you don't sit back down, but just join them basically in singing as well. And so the words of institution, what this is all about, that on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And breaking it, he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And then after they had dined, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Shed for the forgiveness of sins. Shed for the lives of many. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread or you drink of this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. Let's pray and prepare our hearts today. Lord God, this morning... We pray that you would make us very aware of how much we need you, as we were preaching about this morning, of how you're the only thing, Jesus, that we need. I pray, Lord, for those who have been on the outside of faith looking in, that this morning would be their spiritual birthday, that they would proclaim you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. 
and therefore be able to partake here this morning. Lord God, fill us anew with the wonder of the sacrifice that you committed, that you did for us, you made for us. And Lord, of the filling you give us with your Holy Spirit as we remember this communion today. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. We're going to call the elders up at this particular time. Uh, and then we're going to have one other elder. For those of you who cannot leave your seats for whatever reason, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand, and Dan Dieter uh, is going to take another communion tray and serve you at your seat. So come on forward, guys. There we go. There we are. And for you, Gary. Thank you. All right, and for whoever our rover is here this morning, oh, it's, uh, it's Gary Folkman's our rover this morning. There we go. Okay, we're going to start by dismissing this row over here, and this, or this section over here and this section over here. And, uh, of course, have the worship team come first. And this section here, and this section here. Stand against what a powerful name it is. The name. 
name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. He is truly all that you need. Think of that this week. Go in peace, go in love, and walk and dance with Jesus today. And all God's people said, amen.